Hochverehrter Chief Rabbi Goldstein, verehrter Vorstand des Bundes traditioneller Juden in Deutschland Grünberg, verehrter Rabbi Spinner, liebe Mitglieder, Gäste und Freunde des Rabbiner Seminars und der Juristischen Fakultät, vor allem lieber Martin Heger, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie alle im Namen der Humboldt-Universität zu Berlin und deren juristischer Fakultät als Dekan hier im Senatssaal unter den Linden recht herzlich begrüßen. Für die juristische Fakultät ist es eine große Ehre und Freude, eine so bedeutende Persönlichkeit als Gast zu haben. Der Referent, Rabbi Goldstein, wird noch gesondert vorgestellt werden, das mache ich jetzt nicht. Ich konzentriere mich auf einige Bemerkungen zu Universität und Fakultät. Die Humboldt-Universität, die damals aber einfach die Berliner Universität war, als Reformgründung zu Beginn des 19. Jahrhunderts, besaß von Anfang an eine juristische Fakultät, die auch von Beginn an mit herausragenden Gelehrten besetzt war. Ich möchte den heutigen Anlass nutzen, einige Sätze zu der Tradition jüdischer Wissenschaftler an der Juristischen Fakultät der Berliner Universität zu sagen. War die Universität im 19. Jahrhundert in den sogenannten Berliner Antisemitismusstreit einbezogen, so prägten doch schon bald bedeutende jüdische Rechtsgelehrte das Bild der Fakultät. Ich hebe nur einige Namen hervor. Friedrich Julius Stahl als freilich zum Protestantismus konvertierter Staatsrechtler und Staatsphilosoph eine Art Theoretiker der hochkonservativen Richtung preußischer Staatlichkeit. Der Handelsrechtler Levin Goldschmidt, immerhin der akademische Lehrer Max Webers. War einer der bedeutendsten und interessantesten Strafrechtler und Prozessrechtler nicht nur seiner Zeit. Er wurde 1933 mit einem Lehrverbot in Berlin belegt, 1934 wurde er nach Frankfurt strafversetzt um wenig später dort entlassen zu werden. Er starb 1940 in der Emigration in Montevideo. Der Sachenrechtler Martin Wolf galt als derjenige Berliner Professor, über die juristische Fakultät hinausgreifend übrigens, der den größten Lehrerfolg überhaupt hatte, also dessen Lehrseele am vollsten waren, weil er den besten Unterricht machte. Sein Lehrbuch des Sachenrechts hatte bis in unsere Zeit wissenschaftliche Bedeutung. Wolf emigrierte nach England. Der Romanist, also Römischrechtler Fritz Schulz und einer der Begründer der modernen Rechtsvergleichung, Ernst Rabel, nachdem noch heute die wichtigste deutschsprachige Zeitung für Rechtsvergleichung benannt ist, emigrierten ebenfalls. Die Fakultät ist sich ihrer Verantwortung angesichts der entlassenen oder vertriebenen Kollegen bewusst. Das leitet zu meinem zweiten Punkt über. Wir sind froh und stolz, seit 1996 die Berliner Studien zum jüdischen Recht in Kooperation mit jüdischen Institutionen etabliert haben zu können. Der Unterricht jüdischen Rechts an der juristischen Fakultät einer staatlichen Universität ist in Deutschland und vielleicht sogar in Europa einmalig. Religiöses Recht wurde und wird in Deutschland historisch bedingt vor allem als christliches Recht verstanden. In einer Zeit religionssoziologischer Veränderungen von Internationalisierung und Globalisierung sind jedoch auch andere religiöse Rechte in den Blick zu nehmen. Angesichts der Verbindung mit und der Verantwortung der Fakultät vor ihren ehemaligen jüdischen Mitgliedern und auch aus einem großen Sachinteresse heraus passen sich die Berliner Studien zum jüdischen Recht in den Grundlagenbezug, den die Fakultät hochhält, vorzüglich ein. Von Bernhard Schlink initiiert und inzwischen von zahlreichen Fakultätsmitgliedern getragen, an deren Spitze Martin Heger, der noch etwas genaueres dazu gleich sagen wird, wird dieses Angebot auch von den Studierenden sehr gut angenommen. Jedes Sommersemester unterrichtet Rabbi Blanchard, daneben finden zahlreiche Sonderveranstaltungen statt. Die jährliche Hildesheimer Lecture, die nun schon eine kleine Tradition besitzt, ist ein Teilelement dieses Gesamtprogramms, mit dem wir uns an die Öffentlichkeit wenden. Bedeutende internationale Persönlichkeiten aus dem juristisch-jüdischen Umfeld 
dokumentieren diese Verbindung nach außen. Insofern darf ich nochmal meine und der Fakultät und der Universität besondere Freude zum Ausdruck bringen, dass wir Ihnen, verehrter Rabbi Goldstein, heute als Gast haben, Ihnen zuhören dürfen, von Ihnen lernen dürfen, mit Ihnen diskutieren dürfen. Herzlichen Dank. Dear Chief Rabbi Goldstein, dear Rabbi Spinner, dear Dean Waldhof, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered here this evening in honor of the fourth Hildesheimer Lecture organized jointly by the Berliner Studien zum Jüdischen Recht, the Berlin Studies on Jewish Law, and the Rabbinical Seminary in Berlin, the Berlin, Rabbiner Seminar zu Berlin. Prior to its censure, uh, censure by the Nazis in 1938, in the aftermath of the pogrom night, the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary, named after its founder, Israel Hildesheimer was likely the most relevant institution for the education of traditional rabbis in Western Europe. In 2009, the, the, the rabbinical seminary in Berlin was re-established by the Zentralrat der Juden in Deutschland and the Ronald S. Lauder Foundation and has seen, since been run by Rabbi Spinner. Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer, who studied Semitic languages in Berlin and other places during the 19th century and received a PhD in Halle, developed the idea of combining religious orthodox education with the studies of other academic fields. This concept is the cornerstone of rabbinical seminaries to the present day. Hildesheimer himself was never able to combine his education at the rabbinical seminary with lectures and studies selected from the university's course catalog in his lifetime. Opening up this possibility to students of the rabbinical seminary today, however, is the stated goal of the cooperation between the Berlin Studies of Jewish Law, a program founded by the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Theology here at Humboldt University and the Rabbiner Seminar to Berlin. This, the series of lectures known as the Hildesheimer Lectures, held here in the Senatssaal, is one of the achievements resulting from this outstanding cooperation. Therefore, uh, Rabbi Goldstein's lecture tonight is not only in line with the long-standing tradition of top-class academic lectures, but also in line with the tradition of Hildesheimer's rabbinical seminary. By joining forces and establishing this series of lectures, the Rabbinical Seminar in Berlin and the Berlin Studies of Jewish Law have turned Rabbi Hildesheimer's vision into a reality. Lectures like the one we are about to hear tonight are the instrument through which Jewish traditional teachings can be introduced into the university's academic curriculum. Hildesheimer and his peers had not been able to achieve such a degree of intellectual exchange. Universities especially were not willing to collaborate with the Hildesheimer Seminary on organizing uh, academic lectures. When the Nazis finally came into power, Jewish studies were completely banned from the universities. The dean told you some of the uh, uh, famous uh, professors of law, Jewish professors of law at this faculty till 1933. The current cooperation in which the Humboldt University is represented by the Berlin Studies of Jewish Law aims at reintegrating the, the Jewish analytical thinking into the academic curriculum of Humboldt University. It brings together the faculties of theology and law as the respective careers of the program. For the commemoration service in May 2013, Remembering the book burning of 1933, the faculties choose Professor Rabbi Zvi Blanchard as the keynote speaker. Rabbi Blanchard is a longtime visiting professor of Jewish law here at Humboldt University. With the help of Rabbi Blanchard's speech, we were able to show that the science of Jewish studies that had wrongfully been expunged by, uh, from academic life in Germany 80 years ago has returned. Just a few months later, the Hildesheimer Lectures were established as a second important pillar in reintroducing Jewish studies into the university's syllabus. 
The importance of this step was reflected in the prominent keynote speaker at the opening event in December 2013, the European Chief Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt. Since then, the series of Hildesheimer lectures has assembled great Jewish thinkers from all over the world who have spoken right here in this hall. The list of past speakers includes Rabbi, uh, Chief Rabbi Goldschmidt from Moscow, uh, Professor Raham Rakova from Israel, Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs from Great Britain, as well as our longtime visiting professor for Jewish law, Zvi Blanchard, and his predecessor, Rabbi um, David Bleich, who was awarded a honorary doctorate from the Faculty of Law um, of Humboldt University, both of who are from York City. Chief Rabbi Ron Goldstein, uh, our lecturer tonight, lecturer tonight, will be the first representative of Jewish law we welcome from South Africa. Uh, as have his academic colleagues from other countries who have been our guests in the past, Rabbi Goldstein represents the global perspective of his home continent, Africa, and the entire southern hemisphere. The lecture tonight will be held beneath a portrait um, of the explorer and scientist Alexander von Humboldt. He left Berlin to travel the world and study nature's wonders. His brother, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, inspired by the ideas of enlightenment, founded the Berlin University, which became the most progressive school of its time. Here in this hall, with this lecture series, we unite ins insights, ideas, and knowledge of Jewish law from all parts of the world. This is the mutual goal of the Berlin Studies of Jewish Law and the Rabbinical Seminary in Berlin. And now I would like to extend a warm, warm welcome to you, Rabbi Goldstein. Thank you so much for accept, accepting the long journey to come and speak to us tonight. We are looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you very much. Who are the vulnerable? Who needs protection? Where are the vulnerable to be found in 2017? In the Europe of the nation state, our assumption has always been that it is the minority who are vulnerable, the few who are weak and need protection. This has certainly been the Jewish experience in Europe. Whether the frame of reference was religion, race, or even nationality, Jews have been a small minority, vulnerable and in need of protection. This emphasis on protecting the few from the many is also to be found in the Torah, the Pentateuch, with its focus on the poor, the widow, and the stranger. The Torah implores one to empathize with and provide for the weak and vulnerable few, as we remember that we ourselves were once strangers in a strange land. And yet, it is not always or only minorities who are vulnerable. Consider apartheid South Africa, where the disenfranchised and persecuted were the majority. And consider the holiday market just four kilometers from here, or the promenade in Nice. Who there was vulnerable? The majority discovered and continues to discover that it itself is vulnerable and very much in need of protection. So who is vulnerable and where are the vulnerable to be found? Everyone, anywhere, can be vulnerable. Even members of a majority, even those who seemingly possess power. This alarming recognition makes the protection of the vulnerable not simply a discussion of high-minded moral responsibility, but also one of universal self-interest. The topic, therefore, is inescapable, both very old and very contemporary, which makes it entirely appropriate for this evening's lecture. The annual Hildesheimer Lecture, a joint presentation of the Rabina Seminar zu Berlin and the Humboldt University School of Law, offers an authentic, traditional Jewish perspective on a matter of contemporary relevance. We are therefore pleased that Chief Rabbi Dr. Warren Goldstein was able to accept our invitation to deliver this year's Hildesheimer Lecture. Following in the tradition of the Rabbina Seminar zu Berlin, Chief Rabbi Dr. Goldstein is both an outstanding Torah scholar and possesses an accomplished academic background. Rabbi Goldstein studied at the famous Yeshiva of Johannesburg for more than a decade and is a qualified rabbinic court judge. After completing his law degree, he received a doctorate from the University of Witz Law School with a dissertation, later a best-selling book entitled Defending the Human Spirit, Jewish Law's Vision for a Moral Society. Rabbi Dr. Goldstein became Chief Rabbi of South Africa in 2005 at the age of only 33 
and has since played a decisive role in helping to shape a new South African society, one characterized by a commitment to equality and the protection of the vulnerable. As part of these efforts, his Bill of Responsibilities, adopted by South Africa's Department of Education and taught in schools across the country, has instilled the importance of compassion and respect for the dignity and well-being of others in a generation of young South Africans. It is therefore our great honor and privilege to welcome Chief Rabbi Dr. Goldstein to present this year's Hildesheimer Lecture. Thank you, Rabbi Savage, for the warm words of introduction, which I appreciate very much. Professor Waldhoff, Professor Hager, Rabbi Spinner, Rabbi Halpern, honored rabbis, communal leaders, academics, students. It's uh, truly an honor to be able to be here this evening with you and to deliver this important lecture, which is a tribute really to the two institutions that have partnered together to spread knowledge and specifically to spread the knowledge of Jewish law in the world. And I would like to take the opportunity to pay tribute not only to the School of Jewish Law at Humboldt University, but also, of course, to the, to the Rabina Seminar of Berlin, to the fact that these two very important institutions have teamed up in a spirit of partnership is so important, and this evening is a testament to, to their work and their partnership. And I would like to thank them very much for the gracious invitation. It is indeed an honor to address this august gathering and to continue this very honorable tradition of an annual lecture, and I thank you for that opportunity very much. Friends, we live in confusing times, dangerous times, and times filled with tremendous opportunity. And it is times like these that we need to turn for insight to Jewish law. And it has so much to offer. I'd like to, to quote to you from the previous chief rabbi of, this, of the State of Israel, Chief Rabbi Herzog. And he said something very important about the relevance of teaching Jewish law to the world. And that's why I think the, the School of Jewish Law here is uh, doing such an important and outstanding work in continuing this, uh, this tradition of teaching about Jewish law because it has so much to offer. Rabbi Herzog, who was the very first chief rabbi of the State of Israel, wrote a two-volume work on Jewish law for an English-speaking audience. And, and he wrote as follows in the introduction to his work on Jewish law. It has been my ardent striving throughout to afford the general student of jurisprudence at least an elementary conception of the elaborate, massive, towering structure of Jewish law, when its literary sources have been made more accessible and its accumulated treasures of the ages have been laid bare, the world's jurist may yet come to realize that the utter neglect of Jewish law on the part of students of law and of cultured persons generally had meant a serious loss to the progress of humanity. This is what Chief Rabbi Herzog wrote so many years ago talking about the importance of Jewish law and what it has to offer, because it is indeed an ancient system of law that has formed the basis of so much of Western tradition and yet has been ignored, not only because of generations of prejudice, but also because its sources have been written in Hebrew and Aramaic and have been inaccessible to many people. And so the work of promoting an understanding of Jewish law advances society in so many ways. And specifically in the area of morality, because Jewish law has stated from the beginning, and this is what the book of Deuteronomy says, it says you shall safeguard and perform them, for it is your wisdom and insight in the eyes of the people, who shall hear all of these statutes and say, surely a wise and insightful people is this great nation, and which this nation has righteous laws and statutes, such as this entire Torah that I place before you today. And so the book of Deuteronomy makes a very important claim. It describes the laws of the Torah, describes the laws 
of Jewish law, of the Talmud, of the written and the oral Torah, as righteous laws and statutes. And there's a very interesting word, righteous, because it is making a claim about law which is very interesting. It is calling for the righteousness of law, not only the structure and the order. What does a legal system provide a society? A legal system provides a society with order, with structure, with predictability, with a way of governing the affairs of human beings in a manner which is dignified and which is structured and ordered. But it's more than order. This is the primary Jewish insight, is that law is not only about an orderly society, it's also about creating a righteous society, one of morality and one of goodness. And I'd like to quote to you a statement from Rabbi Mordechai Gifter, who was one of the leading American Talmudic scholars of the 20th century, who delivered a lecture at a university in which he describes it was the university in, in Cleveland in which he describes the, the quintessential distinctive dimension of Jewish law. And he says as follows, the law itself can be cold and sometimes even cruel if it is designed only to meet the requisites of an ordered society. So you hear what Rabbi Gift is saying, that generally legal systems can be cold and even cruel. Indeed, there is a law even among barbarians. The cruelty and tyranny of the dictator is also framed in the order of law. One is reminded of the words of the psalmist who, in speaking of the tyrant, describes him as being one, and the quote is, who frames violence by statute. The tyrant as being one who frames violence by statute, that is in Psalms 94, verse 20. Now that is such an interesting phrase, who frames violence by statute, because law can be used as a tool of oppression. We know that. As a South African, I know that, because that is the South African experience. The, the apartheid regime structured its oppression of South African society through the legal system. It had a very advanced legal system with elaborate statutes and courts and lawyers and legal departments. And all of those tools were actually just tools of oppression because it brought order to society, but no righteousness and no morality. And of course, there is this, a similar <clears throat> experience here in Germany with the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler also used laws, the Nuremberg laws, where it's, it was the methodology of law which was used as a tool of oppression. And so we know that law by itself does not guarantee a society of goodness. Law creates order, but it doesn't necessarily create righteousness. And this is what the book of Deuteronomy says, a legal system to truly uplift and transform society needs to be a legal system which is filled with righteousness, with goodness, with morality, not just order and structure. Order and structure have to be blended with morality and with righteousness. But then, of course, arises this crucial question. What is the definition of righteousness? What is the definition of goodness? How do you define it? Of course, we can say that it's important for the laws to be good. But whose definition of goodness? How do we find a principle of righteousness which can be adopted to transform society through the law and do it in such a way that uplifts people and transforms society into a place of goodness and decency. What is that definition? And I would like to explore with you this evening an understanding of Jewish law to try and find the, the essence of what morality is about. If we are to define what is the defining essence of morality, what would that be? What is the essence of righteousness? When the book of Deuteronomy says, I place before you, and that someone will say that these laws are righteous laws, how do we define righteousness? And the methodology that I would like to use is a methodology which is very case-based and practical. As many legal scholars will know that there are different legal systems in the world that have a different approach. The, the, um, the continental legal systems, those that come from the, the Roman Dutch tradition of legal systems, as is well known in, in South Africa, and of course here in, in the continent, is very much based on principles. 
But the Anglo-American system is, is often very much case-based, and I'm talking specifically in the laws of delict, in the laws of damages, where in the Anglo-American system there are torts, which are specific cases of, of damage, which, uh, which, which are established by the law and for which a person can claim damages. In, in the continental system, in the Roman Dutch tradition, we talk about principles. So there are two different approaches within law. Within certain traditions of legal systems, the focus is on broad-ranging principles. Within other legal traditions, the focus is on cases <clears throat> and specific examples, and from the cases you derive the principles. The Jewish tradition is very much practically based. You will not find, in general terms, you will not find in the Talmud, in the written law itself, you will not find sweeping statements made about general values of the system as a whole. Instead, you will find an analysis of one case after another after another. A student of, of Talmudic law will know that when you open the pages of the Talmud, you encounter real life examples, and it is from those examples that the general principles have to be derived and extracted. And so if we are to define and extract the essence of the definition of what is morality, what is righteousness, then we need to delve into the practical cases of Jewish law and try and extract from it. And there are four particular cases that I would like to place before you, which are essentially a puzzle, in that what we find that there are four specific examples that I want to share with you, only in brief terms. We won't be able to go into the full depth of each example, but just to give the outline of the, of the examples, they are all examples of laws where we find a long-standing tradition within Western law. And when, we, when I use the term Western law, it's a broad term, referring both, of course, to the continental legal systems of the Roman Dutch tradition, and then and, and, uh, the, the, the legal systems which applied right across the continent of Europe, then of course in English law, American law, and, uh, and also in South African law. These are all systems that, form, that fall in general terms within the concept of Western law. And what you find is in these four cases that I want to place before you, an anomaly, that you'll find a tradition within Western law where it is across the board, uniformly all taking one position and Jewish law taking a different position. And then to try and understand that anomaly, how can it be that all of the West systems of Western law, whether the Anglo systems, the continental systems, the American system, right across the board, everyone takes one position and Jewish law takes a diametrically opposite position and trying to understand how the, the differences arise between the, the legal traditions of the West versus Jewish law. And the specific examples that I want to deal with, number one, is the issue of rape in marriage, which is interesting that in Western law, for generations, and going back um, uh, right to the time of, of Roman law and all the way through, there has been a general acceptance that it is not considered a, a crime for a man to rape his wife. They have different reasons for it. In the Anglo tradition, it's because at the moment of marriage, irrevocable consent is given. In, in the Roman Dutch tradition, it is because the wife is considered to be the property of her husband. So they have different approaches to it. And this, this, con, this dispensation, which is, uh, allows that the act of rape is not considered to be a crime, was allowed in, in all of these legal systems and right up to the end of the 20th century. In America, in England, and, uh, and, and in so many Western countries, and right across the continent, this was accepted. What is fascinating is that happened in, in Israel, there came a, a, a case in, in Israel <clears throat> where um, it was State versus Cohen, and Mr. Cohen um, is not actually out of a proverbial Jewish joke. There was a real Mr. Cohen who was called before the court for the crime, accused of the crime of raping his wife. And uh, this, this case was brought, it was, um, took place in 1981 in the state of Israel. And his defense was that 
because it, as we know, the state of the modern state of Israel unfortunately does not have Jewish law as its primary legal code. It has adopted the English and, and a combination of English and Turkish law, but it does allow for times for an introduction of elements of Jewish law within the legal system. And um, uh, Mr. Cohen uses his defense that his actions were not illegal because he was basing himself on the English law that allowed rape in marriage. Even in 1981, English law allowed rape in marriage. And the prosecution put forward the following argument before the court. That may be in terms of English law that it is legal what he has done, but in terms of Jewish law, it is a crime because it is completely forbidden in the context of Jewish law for a man to rape his wife and there's no, there's no dispensation and no allowance for that at all. <clears throat> and the court brought in Jewish law and overturned the English law and said that from then on the law of the state of Israel would be that it would be illegal for a man to rape his wife based on Jewish law. So this is the one example where we find this anomaly where you have Western law for a tradition of more than 2,000 years across all of these jurisdictions all taking this one position and Jewish law taking a different position and, and standing as an anomaly versus everything that took place within Western law. Another example, and this is more of a political example, but it touches on the heart of a legal system. The, the Western tradition, until the French Revolution and the American uh, Constitution, the Western tradition was very much one of the exercise of absolute political power, which meant that a king or a ruler, an emperor of a state, was given absolute power to govern in the way that he saw fit. And I'm not talking here about the notion of democracy. There's something else, because democracy is a question about how the people who govern a society are elected. Are they elected through a, a closed council or are they elected by the people? But there comes a more fundamental question. A person who then exercises political power, whether it is as a result of democracy or it's as a result of some other method of choosing the leader, how is that power exercised? Is it exercised absolutely? that the person who has the power in their hands has the right to do whatever they wish to do or are there limitations placed on their power? And within Western tradition, and not only Western tradition, throughout the world, the basic assumption was that the person who wields executive power does so absolutely. A very modern concept arose, and that was from the time of the French Revolution and then more specifically the American Constitution, and that is the notion of a separation of powers that you have executive powers, legislative powers, and judicial powers, there's a separation of powers, and that the person who wields executive power is not the final authority on, um, on uh, is not the final authority and doesn't carry the, the, the final power within the society. They are answerable to a supreme constitution which is enforced and holds the executive accountable through the judiciary, through the courts. The concept of the judiciary being the supreme force within a society is a very modern one in Western, in Western society and certainly in the rest of the world, which we're parts of the world that haven't even adopted it to, to this day. And yet, in Jewish law, the judiciary has always been supreme. There's the concept of the Sanhedrin, the Grand Sanhedrin that was established of 71 judges and the king was subservient to the Sanhedrin, which means that firstly, that there was a separation of powers between the executive powers of the king and the Sanhedrin exercising judicial power. But secondly, the king was held accountable by the Sanhedrin, meaning if he wanted to go to war or his defense budget, or in fact, the king could even, according to certain sources, be impeached for uh, improper conduct and held accountable by the judiciary. And so this notion of a separation of powers is a very modern one, but yet an ancient one in Jewish law, and it was always there, right from the beginning of Jewish law, the notion that it is ultimately the judges who are the, the final authority within a society. And that is, such an important, that is such an important part of maintaining freedom within a society. In fact, in South Africa at the moment, we have seen that in action, because uh, South Africa is a relatively young democracy, but one of the big battles has been holding the president accountable to the values of the constitution and it's been a remarkable victory of the new south africa which is such a young democracy it was only established in 1994 
and it yet has been stretched to its limit, where President Jacob Zuma was, um, was uh, subjected to an inquiry by the public protector concerning the allegations of corruption that he was perpetrating, and the public protector made findings, the president ignored the findings, and the, the, the opposition parties took the president to the Constitutional Court and asked the Constitutional Court to order the president to accept and to live by the findings of the public protector, which is in fact what happened. The court found the president in violation of the Constitution, in violation of the authority of the public protector, ordered the president to, to pay back the money that he had taken unlawfully and to, and to fulfill all of the requirements of the public protector, which he has, which he has done. And so that was a great victory for democracy, but you could see, and it's something that as South Africans we have experienced firsthand, the importance of having a separate and independent judiciary, a separation of powers, and to ensure that absolute power is not in the hands of a single individual, but that has always been the approach of Jewish law. And so once again, that's the second example that we have, which is an example of how Western law went on one tradition, for thousands of years, Jewish law always took another position, and now in modern times, Western law has come around to the position of Jewish law. And the question that I'm placing before you is, what is it in Jewish law that drove it to these answers, answers which the world has come to only in recent times? There's a third example, and that is the example of judicial torture. Torture is a controversial topic today, but the controversies that range around torture is generally police torture, where, it's, where torture is used as a tool of extracting information from, from an accused, and particularly uh, where it's been most controversially used in the United States, where um, terrorists are arrested and there's an attempt to extract information from them in order to reveal about the terrorist network. And there's a discussion about that. I'm not talking about police-driven torture. That's a separate discussion which we don't have time for tonight. But in in Western law, in Western law, and this, this is right from the time of Greek law and Roman law and throughout the continent and in England and um, th throughout Europe, in Western law, there was an acceptance of a concept which is called judicial torture, where the judge orders a criminal accused to be tortured to extract a confession. And then that confession is admissible in court and the person is held guilty based on that confession. And judicial instructed torture is an accepted part, was a, was a very well accepted part of Western law and it was on the statute books. There for all to see, and it's, it's famous uh, in England, of course today you can go and see the, 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 the rack and all of the various instruments of torture that were used. But what people fail often to understand is that we're not talking about police-driven torture, we're talking about judicial torture where a judge actually instructs it. Now, if you contrast this with Jewish law, it's fascinating because Jewish law not only never accepted judicial torture, Ju Jewish law rules that a confession, even a voluntary confession, given without any pressure, is inadmissible as evidence because it's regarded to be tainted. You cannot accept the word of the criminal accused for, for his own conviction, even if it is voluntarily uh, given. Of course, through the Miranda decision and other um, famous cases in American law and in Western law, there is uh, an, an, a, um, a tremendous f emphasis is placed on ensuring that there's no coercion of an accused today. And so Western law has come round to this position and a person has to be aware of their rights and be aware of their right to have legal representation and not to uh, deliver any kind of confession or anything which is incriminating without a legal representative. So Western law has, has made progress towards this position. But here's the, again the anomaly where you have Western law having a system that accepts judicial torture, Jewish law which doesn't even accept a voluntary confession confession, and how is that so? The fourth and final example that I wanted to put before you is that of the question of, um, of poverty alleviation. There were laws throughout Europe and in the West, and for many, many centuries, laws that made it forbidden for a person to beg for money, laws that actually made it a crime to be homeless. Today we talk about looking after the um, homeless and unemployed. 
but there was for centuries, for centuries, it was the accepted position throughout the continent and in Britain that the, it, was, it was illegal to beg and, um, and, and in fact illegal to be homeless. There, there, for, for many centuries, I mean as far as in 18th century France, the, the law was that a person, a vagrant, in other words a homeless person or unemployed person, was actually branded with a V on their, on their skin for vagabond and a person who was caught begging illegally was branded with an M for mendicant, uh, a beggar. And many um, horrific punishments were, were inflicted. The, um, um, in Britain in particular, there was the law of settlement and removal and there were many terrible things that occurred in the context of that law. Um, and there, there are many examples that were common occurrences uh, which, which took place. There's, there's a, a reported case of a woman, Ellen Dixon, a blind woman who was whipped, stocked, and sent away to Windermere in 1635 because she was, caught, she was caught begging. Now, this sounds horrific to us, but this was the standard position right across the continent and throughout Western law because the position was taken is that you should be working. How, how do you come to beg when you should be a person who should be working? And, and yet, once again, Jewish law took a position which was that if a person puts out their hand, you give unconditionally, you don't ask questions. It, uh, as it says in the book of Deuteronomy, a person puts out their hand, you put charity money in their hand. And so once again, you find this anomaly. Centuries of Western law in one direction, Jewish law taking a contrarian view in the opposite direction, but going against the trend. And, and what is very significant is that as human beings, one of the most powerful influences that we have is the influence of the society in which we live and that we are influenced by one another. So the fact of the matter that you have right across the continent and in Britain and then later on in, in the United States and across the West, you have a particular position taken on a number of, of different crucial human rights issues where everyone is going in one direction, Jewish law is going in the other direction, you have to ask your question and that is why? What is at the heart of it? And I think if we look at these four cases that I mentioned, we'll be able to uncover a principle. A principle which is not mentioned specifically by Jewish law. You won't find, the principle I'm about to share with you, you won't find it written anywhere because the methodology of Jewish law is not to give broad sweeping principles, but rather, as we said before, case-based, looking at specific cases and extracting the principle from the cases. And what principle can be extracted here? I believe a principle which could be called, but it's my own term, and, and you won't find this anywhere in, in, in the Jewish law writings as a specific term, but it's a, a term that, uh, that I think is, is an accurate description of what is going on here, and that is the vulnerability principle. Meaning, Jewish law took a position, which is this. Analyze in the situation who is in the most vulnerable predicament. And the responsibility of the legal system is to protect the vulnerable. You find this principle throughout the Torah. You'll find that, and, and the Talmud counts it, that 36 times the Torah, the five books of Moses, mentions the importance of protecting the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. 36 times, which is more times than any other commandment is mentioned in the five books. The importance of protecting the most vulnerable members of society. You find in, in the Hebrew prophets, in the prophets of the Bible, you will find mentions of the importance of protecting the vulnerable and, and, the, uh, and, and, and the importance which, which God gives to it. So for example, you'll find Isaiah the prophet who says, learn to do good, seek justice, Vindicate the victim, render justice to the orphan, take up the grievance of the widow. That's in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Jeremiah the prophet says, Thus says God, administer justice and righteousness and save the robbed from the hands of the oppressor. Do not taunt and do not cheat the stranger, the orphan and the widow, and do not spill innocent blood in this place. That's Jeremiah 22, verse 3. And so on and so on. There are verses throughout the Hebrew Bible, which talk about the importance of protecting the most vulnerable members of society. And I believe that if you look at the four examples that are placed before you, you will see that in each example, Jewish law seeks to protect the most vulnerable. And that is why it came out with the, with the, with the correct solution to these problems. 
in the example of rape in marriage, the uh, the wife in the in in the in the marriage is the is the vulnerable party, vulnerable to the physical abuse of her husband, and therefore she is protected. In the situation of the exercise of political power, it is the absolute monarch, the tyrant, who is exercising the power. His people are those who are most vulnerable to the abuse of power. In the example of judicial torture, it is the criminal accused who is in the position of dire vulnerability. Anyone who is accused of committing a crime is in a very vulnerable situation because the state has complete command of that person's freedom, has complete command of that person's life. And so there's actually no more vulnerable person than a criminal accused. And then, of course, in the situation of poverty alleviation, a person who has no home, who has no job, who has no money, is a person who is in a situation of extreme vulnerability. And so uh, the, the guiding principle that we can extract from these four cases, as well as looking at broadly at, this, at the verses which are throughout the Torah, the five books, and throughout the Hebrew Bible, we will find the concept of protecting the vulnerable that goes to the heart of what Jewish law is all about. So if we come back to our original question, what is the definition of righteousness? Then we have to say, from a Jewish law perspective, righteousness is defined as protecting the most vulnerable members of society. That is the definition of righteousness from a Jewish law perspective. And it is that that has driven Jewish law since its inception. And of course, as Jews, we believe that it was given by God at Mount Sinai. And so he gave this system of law for all future generations to say, this is an eternal principle of righteousness and goodness and morality for all times, the importance of, of, of protecting the vulnerable. What does the vulnerability principle mean for us today? It means the following. Number one. The vulnerability principle gives us understanding of the role of a legal system. Because what, if we go back to our original question, what is the role of a legal system? Is the purpose of a legal system to establish an order and structure in society? Certainly that's an aspect of it. But we've seen that a legal system which is purely based on structure and order can be a cruel and unforgiving legal system. So now we understand that the purpose of a legal system is to protect the most vulnerable. And it goes to the heart of the purpose of law. Because what is a society that has an absence of law? That is a society that lives in the state of nature. These are the, the, the philosophers speak about as, as the state of nature, which, um, which uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes famously called the life in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. If you take human beings out of civilization and you put it in a state of nature without any civilization, then life is nasty, brutish, and short. What is the purpose of law? It's to protect life and to ensure that it's not nasty, brutish, and short. How does it do that? By protecting those who are most vulnerable. And of course, it, it must be the purpose of law. Because if the purpose of law was the survival of the fittest, well, you don't need law for that. You can allow that to, to be governed by the state of nature. The state of nature allows for the survival of the fittest. Law comes to redeem the state of nature and to uplift it and to transform it and to refine it. And therefore, uh, the vulnerability principle gives us a proper understanding for the role of a legal system. That's number one. Number two, the vulnerability principle also gives us a measure for how to judge the morality of our societies. If we want to know how we are faring in terms of the righteousness as defined uh, by, by, the, by the morality which God gave us through, through his revelation of the Torah, then if we want to understand what the definition of righteousness, how do we judge our societies, we need to judge our societies by how we treat the most vulnerable members of society. And that's why one of the great um, German rabbis uh, of, uh, of, of, of the, in the history of, of, of this community, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, he famously said in Parshat Mishpatim, which is the, the parsha, which is the section of the law which deals with uh, many of the, the monetary laws of the Torah in the book of Exodus, he says it begins with the laws of the Evid Ivri of the servant. That is where the laws begin. The very first law given in terms of monetary jurisprudence is the laws relating to the servant. 
Why? Because he says the servant is the most vulnerable member of society and therefore you must start the laws with that because that is the beginning and that is how a society is measured. So, that's, so the vulnerability principle number one gives us an understanding of the purpose of law in the first place. The vulnerability principle also helps us to establish and to judge the morality of the societies in which we live. What made apartheid South Africa evil is that it was a society that, was, um, that led to, to the oppression of people and the subjugation and the exposing of the vulnerabilities of, of human beings in, 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 in the most terrible way and of course in, in a much more severe fashion that was at the, uh, at, at the heart of the evil of, uh, of, of the Nazi regime. Thirdly, thirdly, the, what the vulnerability principle gives us is, is something else, and that is the, an, an appreciation for the, for the understanding of the complexity of vulnerability. Because here there's a very interesting dimension of this. Um, Jewish law, as we said, doesn't accept a voluntary confession. In fact, Jewish law is, is so opposed to, to criminal punishment that it makes it a requirement, not only can you not accept a voluntary confession, in order to convict a person of murder, for example, you would need two witnesses who witnessed the act of murder, circumstantial evidence being inadmissible, and you also even deliver a warning to the person before the act is perpetrated, making it thereby practically impossible to impose Capital punishment in the case of murder, even though the Bible, in principle, has it on the statute books. And yet, the Talmud raises a situation where, within Jewish society, there was a state of emergency. And where, what happens when, when you have a, a situation developing where there's rampant crime and it's completely out of control, and it gives the, the discretion to the courts in those circumstances to, um, to, to relax some of these very strict laws that make it impossible to impose any form of, uh, of, of punishment, of any form of criminal punishment. And, and why is that? Because the concept of vulnerability can shift. Sometimes the most vulnerable party is the criminal accused. But sometimes the most vulnerable party can be the society itself. See, sometimes it's the criminal accused, who is the, and in an orderly society, the criminal accused is the person that we are primarily concerned with. And so regulations are imposed that make the imposition of any form of criminal punishment almost impossible, with the idea being that education and self-regulation is the ideal of any society. On the other hand, there can be situations where the society itself is so vulnerable to, to, to violent crime that it has to, that it has to um, take certain measures. And, and this, this is a very interesting debate and it's not something that, um, that you know, one can conclusively um, uh, take, take a position, certainly not in the short time that we have. But there was a famous case in South Africa, um, State versus Makwanyane, right at the beginning of the, 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 the democracy in South Africa, where one of the, the very first laws that was placed before the Constitutional Court was the death penalty. And the judges of the Constitutional Court unanimously held the death penalty to be unconstitutional. And they did so in spite of the fact that at the time South Africa was suffering from a wave of violent crime. And, and the debate is this, and, and this is an interesting debate, and, I'm, and I'm not, I don't want to specifically focus on the death penalty because there, if you don't have an effective police force and, and other things are missing, it's not, it's not necessarily uh, going to be, provide all of the answers to violent crime. I'm just saying that the, the Constitutional Court uh, made a ruling on that case without reference to the fact that it's living within the environment of South Africa and a new democracy finding its feet in a situation of, um, of, of unraveling of law and order, and then on, 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 and versus being in, in, um, in, in, in a very orderly society, perhaps somewhere in, in Scandinavia where everything is, is pristine and orderly without any complications, and then saying, well, are you, are you in Johannesburg or are you in Copenhagen? And, and that's, that's a question which lawyers have to ask themselves. And I'm not, I'm not saying and taking a specific position on the, on the death penalty. It's too complicated 
a, a problem to, to debate in, in, in the short time that we have, and it would require a lecture in its own right, but there has to be a consideration for the, for the circumstances of the society and who is the most vulnerable party within, within the society. And similarly, and this is a, a dilemma which Europe is facing at the moment. On the one hand, when people are refugees and they are running from situations of conflict and terrible oppression, then they are the most vulnerable people on earth. Who can be more vulnerable than a person who has no home, who has no livelihood, who has no safety, who has no education to, to give to their children, who have no food to even give their children, and are running for their lives. There can be no people who are more vulnerable than, than refugees. On the other hand, there is also the vulnerability of society to, to potential terror attacks. And one has to, one has to um, create policy, and, and I'm not suggesting I have the, the answers of what the specific policies that have to be created, but what needs to enter the debate is that in the same way there is a moral principle which requires one to look after refugees, there's also a moral principle, the vulnerability principle itself. The, it's, it is the same vulnerability principle which says that you need to protect the vulnerable, the refugees. There's also a vulnerability principle which says you have to protect your society from, uh, from terror attacks. And, and therefore, a society has to craft both policies as well as operational implementation, which achieve both. And both are moral principles. It's, it's very important because, and one can quote um, at, at great length from, from the Hebrew Bible and talk about the stranger, the widow, and the orphan, and welcoming in refugees, and the importance of that, not only from a context of the values of Jewish law, but in, in the context of Jewish history itself. But on the other hand, there has to be an appreciation as well for the importance of the nuance and the, 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 the complexity where the vulnerability principle is not only a vulnerability principle about protecting uh, refugees, but it's also about protecting society from the threat of terror. And I think there needs to be within Western society in general, and I think that, that it is, there, there is a consensus which is gathering around this, but the importance of the fight against terrorism, which is a threat to human civilization, and it's a threat to the values which, uh, which we have all fought so long and so hard to establish within the societies in which we live, the forces um, uh, of, of terrorism represent a threat to that and need to be taken seriously. And we need to speak about the, the threat of terrorism not in the context only of law and order. We need to use the vocabulary of morality, that the fight against terrorism is a fight for morality, it's a fight for freedom, it's a fight for dignity, it's a fight to protect vulnerable people from attack, uh, from savage attack from, from those who, 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 um, who do not subscribe to civilized values. And, and that becomes an important part, and, it, and, it, and if, if it is only about the vocabulary which we, which we use, that itself will be a step forward. To, to be able to make the discussion of terrorism not just about law and order and security, but about morality, the morality of protecting the vulnerable, that will be a step forward. There is something else that we can learn from the, from the vulnerability principle, and it relates to this idea of the complexity of vulnerability, because we mentioned in, in the fourth example uh, this evening is the, is the importance of giving financial and other assistance to poor people, to help alleviate poverty. And whereas for centuries there was a deep discomfort in Western society about helping those who are destitute, and it took a long time to, to work that out of the system, there, there, there is another dimension to, to vulnerability, and that touches on the future of the welfare state. And it's, some, it's another issue which Europe is grappling with at the moment. What is the future of the welfare state, of a state which provides financial assistance to people in various forms throughout the society? And, and in a certain sense, the pendulum has now swung. Whereas in Western law, there was the persecution of the, what they called the, the undeserving poor, the pendulum has now swung to where in, in Western societies, there is a, a, a very um, serious concern with, any, with people living in any situation of inequality or deprivation, and the welfare state sets itself up in order to provide financial and other assistance to people in need. And <clears throat> here comes the, the flip side, because on the one hand, Jewish law is unequivocal in the importance of supporting people financially who are in desperate need. 
unequivocal in that. And you don't ask questions. The person puts out their hand, you give and you help. And, and, that's, uh, and, and that's a crucial part of it. And the Talmud talks about the importance of setting up charitable infrastructure in Jewish communities, the importance of ensuring that people have food, that they have shelter, that they have, they have the money that they need in order to live a proper religious life as well. And so that is, it's unequivocal and it's very clear. On the other hand, on the other hand, Maimonides, the Rambam, writes, basing himself on the Talmud, he says that the highest level of charity, the very highest level of charity, is not to give a person money, but to give a person a job, to give a person a partnership, to give a person an interest-free loan, because then you are helping them achieve financial independence. And I think that we can understand this from the perspective of the vulnerability principle. Because on the one hand, the vulnerability principle says that a person who's in financial need and they're poor, you need to look after them because they're vulnerable. On the other hand, there is no one who is more vulnerable than a recipient of government or any other form of welfare. Because it means their whole future and their livelihood is dependent on the good graces of another person. And if that person decides to withhold the money, that person decides to withhold this, the support, then, then, then the recipient of that welfare is in a, in a terrible predicament. And so there's nothing more vulnerable than to depend on the largesse of another human being so that you do not control your own destiny and you do not have your own destiny in your own hands to be able to look after yourself and after your family. And so therefore, the same vulnerability principle which says that unconditionally you must give to the poor is the same vulnerability principle that says the highest value is a value of financial independence so that a person should not have to receive welfare. And Jewish law sets up a number of mechanisms to achieve this. Number one, practically, and, and these are some practical ideas that can be implemented by any state and it would be a way to, to helping people move from welfare to financial independence. Number one is education. We know that the value of education has deep roots in Jewish law. The first uh, schooling system was established going back uh, in Talmudic times, um, more than 2,000 years when the first school, national schooling system was established. I believe the first recorded one in history. I stand to correction on that. But education has been the backbone of Jewish society for thousands of years. As it says in the Torah, Vishinantam Levanecha, you shall teach your children. The Talmud says from the moment that a child can speak, you need to start to educate them. Education is the key, it is the ladder out of poverty, and every single person has a right to a good education. So that was one, that's, one, that's one aspect, education. Number two, access to capital. For a person to be able to, to get out of poverty, they need to have access to capital. And that's why there is a concept um, within Jewish law of, uh, of an interest-free loan as an act of charity to give it because you're entitled, you should be entitled to charge interest. Why can't you charge someone if you charge them for the use of your property? Why can't you charge them for the use of your money? But there's an understanding that people need access to capital. And how do you grant access to capital if not through, through helping them with an interest-free loan? That's a very important aspect of, um, of Jewish law. Debt rehabilitation. When people go out and they make money and they try and they risk and then they fall and, and, they, and they get into debt, society needs to have mechanisms for debt re rehabilitation. And Jewish law has mechanisms. It has, for example, in the sabbatical year that every seven years debts are cancelled. And of course, there's the, the, the famous discussion in the Talmud where that had the, the reverse effect. And again, you can see the nuance of the concept of vulnerability because a person, the, the debtor is the vulnerable party. So is of course protected by, by this law of the cancellation of debts at the sabbatical year every seven years. And then the Talmud says, but they found that then no one was giving loans because they said, well, if the debts are getting canceled after seven years. So the Talmud found a mechanism whereby the loans were ceded to the court and the court became the, 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 the owner of the loan in order, to, in order to be able to enforce the debt even after the sabbatical year. And again, you see the Talmud debating because on the one hand, the whole purpose of the law was to ensure that people had access to capital. If, if, it doesn't, if they can't have access to capital as a result of that same law, then you have a problem. But the principle, however the practicalities are worked out, the principle is access to capital. So you need education, you need access to capital, you need debt, the ability for debt rehabilitation, and you need a free market. 
There, there are many debates within the Talmud. The Talmud comes out unequivocally in favor of a free market where there's no barriers to entry. If a person wants to open up a shop, you can open up, and it's an area of, um, of law, which is in Jewish law, which is sometimes misunderstood. But the, but the position is, if, you, if one person opens up a shop, another person can open up next to him. The Talmud has a debate that says, can you, can you cut the prices? One opinion in the Talmud says you can't undercut your competition because you're taking away his livelihood. And the other opinion, which is the, in accordance with the final position of the law, it says that such a person should be remembered for the good because he's, he's reduced the prices and that benefits the consumer and that a free market, an open market where people can enter and there are no barriers to entry is one that ultimately benefits the consumer but also benefits people who are looking to, to improve themselves. And so on the one hand, Jewish law supports the concept of unconditional welfare. On the other hand, it has a number of mechanisms which are there to help a person rehabilitate themselves and to reestablish themselves. And so what is the, in summary then, uh, before I say the final and concluding point, in summary, what does, the Jew, what does the vulnerability principle mean for us today? Meaning, if, if we look at what we have discussed this evening, we, we have said that from the perspective of Jewish law, law is not only about order and structure in society, it's about goodness, morality, or what the Bible calls righteousness. We then ask, what is the definition of righteousness, what, how do you define goodness, and then through an analysis of certain cases, we came to the conclusion that Jewish law's definition, at least an aspect, let's say, of Jewish law's definition of righteousness, one very important aspect is the protection of the vulnerable. And we've termed that the vulnerability principle, although as I said to you, you will not find anywhere in the literature of Jewish law the specific reference to the concept of, you won't find the wording vulnerability principle, but I believe it to be implicit in every dimension of, uh, of, of Jewish law's approach. And then the, the final part of our discussion has been, what does the vulnerability principle mean for us today in practical terms? And so number one, it gives us an understanding of the purpose of law. Number two, it gives us a measure for the morality of society. Number three, it helps us understand the complexity of the notion of vulnerability. And, and, and that, that we've analyzed in the context of two examples. One is the examples of the refugees, and the other is the examples of welfare, where, uh, where, where the notion of vulnerability is not only to give to those in need because they, they're in need, but there's an ultimate vulnerability to, to be dependent on welfare. And so uh, the, it's the complexity of understanding that vulnerability is not always what it seems. It needs to have further analysis. The final point is this. The vulnerability principle opens our eyes to the ultimate vision of what society should be about. And, and here I would like to share with you the commentary of... Um, a man whose surname is the same as the city, but he, he, lived, he lived far to the east in the city of Volozhin, Rav Naftali Tzvi Berlin was his surname, uh, and he lived in the city of Volozhin to the east of, of where we are. And um, he was one of the great uh, rabbinic leaders and figures of the 19th century, and he had the following insight. To when the Torah says, you shall be kind to the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. The conventional reading of that, that verse is that you shall be kind to the stranger because you know what it is to suffer. And as Jews, we know what it is to suffer and to be at the end of, of prejudice. And therefore, we should be more sensitive than anybody else to, to, to prejudice and to oppressing the stranger because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. But... Rabbi Berlin says this, he says, the verse is to be understood as follows. Be kind to the stranger because you never know the potential within each and every single human being. Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt and look what became of you. You became a great nation, a, a nation of, of brilliance and of achievement a nation that made such an important contribution. And yet, when we were in Egypt, it was about us whom the ruling class said nothing would become of them. It was about us whom the ruling class said 
They have no future. They have no potential. They have no ability. They're a threat to society. They're not an opportunity. They have no greatness. They represent evil. And so we know from first-hand experience as the Jewish people, we know from first-hand experience the awesome potential of the human spirit. Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and look what became of you. And so therefore, be kind to the stranger. Be kind to every human being, because you never know the potential that lies beneath the surface. Because every human being, and this goes to the heart and soul of the Torah's message about the human being, every human being is, as the book of Genesis says, B'Tselem Elohim, created in the image of God. And that means that every human being has a soul, and that soul is a reflection and has a greatness of God himself that has within it the powers of intellect, of altruism, of generosity, of courage, of beauty, of refinement, of greatness, of kindness, of compassion. Every human being has that within them. And we can never underestimate the power of the human spirit to achieve greatness. And so therefore, our sacred task is to defend that human spirit that lies within each and every single human being. And the sacred task of society, if we say, what is the role of government? What is the role of society? The role of government and the role of society and the role of every human being is to ensure that we live in an environment that can unleash the awesome potential of the human being. It's a particular philosophy of the world. It's not, it's not saying the purpose of the government and of a legal system is to look after its people. That's paternalistic. The purpose of the state and the purpose of society is not to look after its citizens. It is to create an environment which is safe, which is nurturing, in order that the greatness of the human spirit within every human being can be unleashed and every person can achieve their maximum potential in life, which is awesome. Because look at the achievements of the world. Look at the achievements in medicine, in building, in science, in literature and in poetry, in technology. All of these are the achievements of the human spirit. The human spirit is truly awesome. And it has the power to change the world and to create worlds. And God has given us that tremendous creative power to create universes. But that human spirit needs to be nurtured. It needs to be protected. It needs to be looked after. It needs to be in, it, it needs to have everything that it needs in order to achieve the greatness that it is capable of. And then when it achieves the greatness, it is that human being that rises to that greatness. And that is what our society is all about. And that is the purpose of society. So the vulnerability principle is not about looking after the vulnerable. That's paternalistic. The vulnerability principle is saying we need to create a safe environment so that human beings can soar and that they can achieve the, the, greatest, the greatest possible. And that they can live up to that calling to be the Tselem Elohim, to be created in the image of God. And that is our holy and sacred task as human beings, building societies together here in Europe, in Africa, <clears throat> and across the world. Our vision should be to create a world in which the human spirit can thrive, a world in which the human spirit can truly reflect the greatness of our Creator. Thank you very much. Guter Rabbanim, lieber Professor Waldhoff, Professor Heger, dear Professors, dear Friends, it's a special honor for me to be here with you tonight. Dear Chief Rabbi Dr. Goldstein, thank you for coming to Berlin and giving us such a special lecture tonight. Dear Professors, dear Ralph Halpern, dear George Spinner, <coughs> dear Andrew Savage and Sarah Serebrinsky and Dr. Skoblo, 
Thank you for organizing everything surrounding the lecture and to, my, to, and to make tonight's evening possible. Please allow me to reflect, reflect on its meaning for all of us. In today's world, many things are confusing. Everything seems possible, so how to choose the right from wrong? Rabbi Silver once said, the, the liberal Judaism says that the Jew of today is sick. One should take off parts of his limbs so he can recover. The traditional Judaism says no, he's not sick, he's just weak. Give him something to eat and he will recover. In the past two decades, a lot, thing, a lot has changed for Jews in Germany, especially the work of the Lauder Foundation and the Central Court of Jews in Germany and the founding of the Rabbiner Seminar helped young people to discover their Jewish roots and to even take on rabbinical positions. The traditional Judaism in Germany today has gained wide acceptance and it continues to gain even more. It follows the law which are based on text, combining reasons and belief, heart and head, argumentation and sentiment. With all of this, it has a lot, of, a lot to offer to the society today. And we can achieve all this, but only if we work together. I would like to stress how important the role of the Humboldt Universität for the Rabbiner Seminar and its students is. Our students have the unique opportunity to gain from the wisdom of professors who teach the Jewish law. And I hope that the professors might also gain from the inter interaction by observing young Orthodox Jews preparing for their rabbinical career. Personally, it makes me very proud to have such an institution as the Rabbiner Seminar in Germany today. It means that the tradition will be carried on and generations of Jews will follow who live according to the Jewish law and are proud of it. It is an investment of eternity and I would like to wish all of you, all of us, much success in achieving this goal. Ich habe jetzt am Ende noch die Ehre, Sie zu einem Empfang und zu guten Gesprächen einzuladen und Ihnen, verehrte Professoren, wünsche ich, dass Sie nicht alles, was Sie gelernt haben, über Bord werfen und nur noch jüdisches Recht lernen, sondern auch bei Ihrem Rechtsladen. Thank you very much.